My name is Yulia Pamphil, and I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America. I'm so pleased to be with you here today, and I would like to thank USAID for co-convening and co-hosting this important event with us. 10 years ago, donors from around the world came together to negotiate a first of its kind agreement to strengthen and secure land rights in the context of food security. This agreement, the Voluntary Guidelines on the Responsible Governance of Land, Forests, and Fisheries, or the VGGT, was negotiated in a unique, inclusive process by the UN Committee on World Food Security. It included more than 100 UN member states, 30 civil society organizations, a private sector network, and numerous observers. After two years of intense negotiations, the VGGT was unanimously adopted in 2012. The arrival of the VGGT was hailed as a watershed moment for the land rights community, and it prompted a flurry of activity and funding. Donors allocated billions of dollars to implement the principles enshrined in the VGGT across dozens of countries. 10 years later, we can look back and ask, what have we accomplished? What have we learned? And where do we go from here? I'm so thrilled to welcome you to this event where we will have a fantastic panel that will take stock of a decade of implementing the VGGT and discuss the future of this landmark agreement. Before the panel begins, we are so pleased to welcome Mr. Adriano Campolina, Senior Policy Officer at the UNFAO to provide a keynote address reflecting from the FAO's perspective on the 10 years of implementing the VGGT, where we go from here and what's next. After Adriano is finished with his remarks, we will move into a panel discussion. I'll introduce the panelists uh, uh, just before the discussion. We will have about uh, 35 to 40 minutes of, uh, Q of discussion, followed by a short audience Q&A, and we will wrap at the top of the hour. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. So please do participate. Um, and uh, we welcome all of your comments and questions. And with that, uh, I will welcome Adriano. Over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks, Carol. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think it's, it's natural to have FAO uh, uh, being part of this panel as the VGGT has become one of the key programs uh, of, uh, of uh, our organization. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of these reflections because somehow uh, I had a, a, a very interesting turn of uh, points of view, uh, if you want, or, 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 or advantage uh, uh, points of view about the VGGT because during the negotiations I was then uh, a part of civil society I was very involved in negotiations with action aid uh, before the negotiations during the times of ecard uh, and other events i was very very uh, working very closely uh, with produce organizations in, in brazil uh, and now i'm leading the land tenure team in fao so it's interesting to be able to reflect 10 years down the line uh, and try to take advantage of these different uh, advantage observation points uh, about the vgt so let me just share uh, my screen briefly. Uh, please do confirm if you can see. Yes, we can see fine, Adriano. Great, thank you so much. So uh, let me, uh, so again, uh, I'm Adriano Capolina, lead the land tenure team in FAO, uh, and the land tenure is part of the Inclusive Rural Transformation Gender Equality Division. Uh, what I will try to do very briefly on the next 10 years is to do a bit of a reflection on the endorsement, technical cooperation, the multi stakeholder platforms and capacity development about the VGGT, reflect a little bit on the adoption, implementation impacts, uh, and try to identify some key challenges and opportunities for improving the governance of tenure uh, in the future. Uh, so as far as the endorsement is, oh, sorry, I think it is stopped somehow. Can we just uh, restart? Um, apologies for that. Give me just one second. My computer is playing games with me. Alrighty. Okay. I think we are back in. Uh, so 
one thing that's very important for us uh, to to reflect and to uh, and to recognize is number one that the VGGT has become a reference for minimum standards on land tenure governance uh, by many international organizations uh, through the endorsement of the guidelines on the on practice that 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 would go from G8 to, to G20 to the World Bank, so uh, OECD. So having the VGT as, as a minimum standard uh, had a very important, uh, I would say, uh, normative aspect uh, of really uh, of really giving the clear a clear sense of uh, of direction uh, when it comes to land tenure to a number of uh, of very important players on development. Uh, second is to say that awareness raising and building support for governance of tenure uh, and technical cooperation uh, has had an important element of number one, uh, really mobilize uh, across the world uh, a number of different uh, different stakeholders uh, and build a capacity on the governance of tenure. So we can we can go here from uh, the the awareness raising of uh, land land tenure rights holders. Uh, the awareness raised and capacity building of uh, of land uh, uh, officers yeah, in different governments around the world, as well as civil society. So I think there has been uh, an important increase uh, on the number of people in different sectors that have become uh, a lot more aware uh, about the guidance uh, uh, about the guidelines, uh, as well as uh, have had their their capacity built. Uh, in a much more in-depth way. For instance, uh, the number of manual te the, the technical manuals that organizations as FAO and others have created uh, about the VGT is extremely important. In our case, we're 12 uh, technical manuals. Uh, we also see a number of initiatives to give visibility to land tenure-related issues uh, that has become extremely important, as well as the creation of uh, different uh, types of coalitions uh, that brought together many stakeholders to try to implement this jointly uh, uh, agreed uh, and developed uh, set of, uh, of priorities. So, for instance, uh, uh, the ILC that's here in the panel is a good example of that, uh, amongst others. Uh, the collaboration among stakeholders uh, through the multi stakeholder platforms is also something that was very important. Uh, uh, FAO alone was uh, involved uh, on more than 30 uh, multi-stakeholder platforms in 15 countries. Uh, and that has a very important element because it's not just to create collaboration space, but it's also to create a space for negotiation and a space for collective action at two levels. Uh, at the level of the collective action amongst different types of stakeholders that come together to the table to negotiate the next steps. Uh, on land tenure, um, either uh, policy making or policy implementation, uh, and so on and so forth, but also the collective action creating a space for a stronger ability to, to the collective action of the land tenure rights holders themselves. Uh, which is quite crucial to change the political uh, or, or the power relations that govern uh, the, the the land land tenure governance issues so it, it creates a space or it creates a possibility uh, of uh, land tenure rights holders uh, to get uh, a stronger ability uh, to influence uh, to to influence and to hold to account uh, the barriers when it comes to uh, land tenure rights uh, and as i said the capacity development has been uh, extremely strong uh, across the world uh, with learning programs and tools for applying the BGT being uh, developed and implemented in more than 60 countries. But having said that, it's important to also uh, to also reflect. And uh, uh, although FAO has an important mandate to uh, to uh, uh, implement this uh, BGT program in the UN system, uh, we also want to be able to be reflexive about that. So, first of all, uh, what is the level of impact in the incorporation of the VGGT into national legal frameworks? Uh, so, we have had uh, the Sierra Leone National Land Policy in 2015. Uh, we have new laws developed in Mali and Liberia. We have the VGGT principles incorporated into new or revised land laws or national land policies in Vietnam, Uganda, Kenya, Sudan, Niger. Uh, and just to bring something very new, last week, uh, the Chad government has endorsed the process of starting a new a new land policy formulation uh, so it's still ongoing but having said that 
uh, the number of countries in which we have achieved sufficient change on the national legal frameworks uh, remains uh, remains not as big uh, as one could have could have uh, ambition for, and I think that that's an interesting element for us to reflect together on why. Uh, secondly, we have had uh, the recognition and protection of legitimate tenure rights especially customary tenure and measurable improvements in length tenure security. In many countries, we did achieve that. Uh, and, and I think one of the, one of the elements that probably uh, comes across as the strongest one uh, is the recognition of women tenure rights. Uh, so in the countries where uh, we have achieved enough process of discussion uh, of length tenure and, and, and the importance of the, the voluntary guidelines, uh, that probably is uh, the, the vulnerable group, if you want, of people in a situation of vulnerability uh, that have had a stronger recognition of rights across quite a number of countries. Uh, I would say less uh, impact has been achieved uh, when it comes to indigenous peoples. Uh, and I think that's an area of great concern for, for, for FAO, uh, as, as well as other uh, groups in a situation of vulnerability. Uh, we have had examples of, uh, of tenure rights uh, of marginalized groups being recogn recognized and, and advanced in countries such as Niger, Kenya, uh, as well as uh, uh, Sierra Leone, Senegal, uh, and many others. Uh, we have had an important element of, uh, of the development uh, of uh, agreements around the responsible land-based investment. Uh, the RAI the RAI, uh, the Response Agricultural Investment, the CFS RAI, was a very important uh, instrument that was adopted, which showed the international community capacity to react uh, after the, 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 the incredible increase on land grabbing uh, in, in, the, in the 2008, 9, and 10. Uh, so there has been an important element of a new agreement into that. Uh, and uh, the last reflection, and I think maybe is the most important one, is that the Rio impact uh, depends a lot on the political economy at the country level, uh, not the VGGT by, by itself. And I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, when you take a, a soft law, uh, and many people on the panel were involved uh, on the negotiation of that soft law, uh, that comes with a limit of its own nature. Uh, what we have, uh, we have seen on the, on the most recent FAO uh, um, external evaluations of our program is that the ability to actually change the political economy around land uh, is the most crucial element uh, that can actually advance land rights. Uh, if we do not change power dynamics, uh, it's very difficult to change actually the hard laws, uh, as well as to, in, to, to make sure that the changed hard laws are implemented uh, in a way uh, that really uh, advance uh, the tenure rights of the most vulnerable. So I think here is, is probably a, a, a key reflection for today, 10 years down the line. Uh, how, what is it that we can do uh, besides having what we believe in FAO as a very important uh, uh, framework uh, for land tenure rights, uh, besides building capacity, besides building uh, awareness, besides build space for most stakeholder dialogue, what else can we do that actually can change the core uh, of the political economy around land uh, and change the power dynamics at council level and at community level uh, to make sure that the implementation happens in the most effective way. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, we, we do identify uh, five key opportunities and well, it's a bit of, a, of, of like a two sides of the same coin uh, of opportunities and challenges. The first one is the more we try to say what, what, what is, what is the, 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 the level of, of success, or what is the level of achievement of the BGGT, we always get into one uh, big challenge, is the lack of uh, sufficient uh, and comprehensive monitoring uh, and evaluation of the impacts of the BGGT across the world. So I think there is, a, there is an analytical challenge and opportunity for all of us uh, to put a lot more effort uh, on a implement, implementing a comprehensive monitoring program and also uh, recreating the political commitment and the political environment uh, towards uh, having countries reporting uh, to the CFS uh, on the progress on each one of 
affected countries. Uh, as you know, on the very end of the VGGT, there is the monitoring evaluation chapter, uh, which we believe could be uh, implemented in a much stronger way, creating a space for accountability. Second, there is still a lot of opportunity for us to improve coordination of initiatives and activities by various stakeholders, including donors, to achieve change at scale. Uh, on our program, we have in many places uh, realized that the level of coordination between different donors, between UN agencies, between civil society, was uh, a lot less than what could have done. And reversely, whenever we have had uh, a sufficiently strong coordination as well as long-term political will, that's where we got the best success. So although the policies where we had have had a, a big change on policy, uh, we're not that many. There is a lot of lessons we can learn from those. And one of those is this, is this one, the ability of coordinate efforts, the ability of uh, having political commitment and long-term political commitment. And thirdly, the ability to understand that changing the governance of land requires long-term commitment by all actors involved. It is an issue that's at the core of power relations and is, doesn't change from a night to a day. Sometimes we even change the policy, but the policy is not implemented. So there's an element here of long-term and very well-rooted collaboration uh, to achieve change. Thirdly, is that we need to scale up and build up upon what has worked well in the first decade. Uh, and particularly here, I want, to, I want to emphasize the MSPs, not as a tokenistic element of uh, bringing the stakeholders along, but, but as an opportunity for land tenure rights holders uh, to have an increased ability uh, to influence policy making and to hold to account uh, dirty barriers for the implementation of such change. Fourthly, uh, we'd like to focus more on securing legitimate tenure rights, especially because customary tenure. I think that's a lesson we are learning over that decade is the centrality of customary tenure uh, for advancing tenure rights of the most vulnerable. And there's a lot more work to be done about that. And finally, uh, we have to do more than to apply the VGGT beyond tenure. Uh, we, we believe that there is a huge space for us to really advance tenure rights <coughs> across a number of other processes. Uh, the, the recent UN, UNCCD uh, COP uh, is a great example of that. Uh, so there's an element of mainstreaming tenure uh, on a number of other negotiations, particularly the ones involved uh, involving in environment and climate change, uh, that may create a great opportunity uh, ahead of us to advance tenure rights. Uh, I thank you very much, and I hope that uh, uh, this would help uh, our discussion uh, coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Adriano, for those remarks. It was really interesting to hear from the FAO's perspective about some of the uh, really vexing uh, challenges, uh, particularly the political challenges to implementing the VGGTs and also some of the ways that you're uh, thinking through addressing those challenges. Uh, so thank you very much. Now we will move into the panel discussion portion of this event. And I'm so pleased uh, to have this fantastic panel with us. I will introduce the panelists. We'll have about half an hour of discussion and then move into Q&A. Uh, first, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Carol Boudreau, Senior Land and Resource Governance Advisor at USAID. Uh, then Michael Taylor, Secretariat Director for the International Land Coalition. Andreas Lang, Advisor for Land Governance for GIZ. And finally, Gregory Myers, former Chair of the VGGT Negotiations and now an independent consultant. Gregory, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you were the chair of the VGGT negotiations at the UN. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of brief background, what was the motivation behind something like the VGGT being proposed? And you know, what was the process like and the feeling in the land tenure community in the spring of 2012 once those negotiations were complete? Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, Julia, I think this is an interesting question to start with because many of the conditions or challenges that we were facing um, in 2008, 10, 11, and 12 are very similar to some of the challenges that we're facing right now. 
you know, we have a, a food crisis on our hands with spiking food and fuel prices. Um, we have financial crises around the world. And some of those same issues that were pushing us to talk about um, addressing land challenges, we're still facing many of those same challenges today. But the, the, just in the interest of time, very quickly, what, what drove the decision to have the voluntary guidelines it was really rooted in something that was happening back in 2008 with the then financial crisis. And there was a lot of concern about large scale land takings or land grabbing, if you will, across the globe uh, and particularly in Africa. And many governments themselves were accused of abetting in this process. Um, and it became of great concern as we saw this large scale land acquisitions taking place. In parallel to that, there was a food uh, crisis and food price shocks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there was some discussion about something that needed to be done about that. So in 2010, the World Bank, FAO, EFOD, and UNCTAD came together and developed something that focused largely on principles for responsible agricultural investment, which was called the PRA, not to be confused with something that the CFS developed five years later. But um, that document seemed to have some problems in it, and there were some concerns about the way in which that was developed, that it wasn't a very inclusive process, and that civil society and the private sector were not involved. And so in some ways, that, that document was set aside, and there was a discussion within the community, that the development community and the land community, that maybe we needed to have something that was more inclusive, more open and transparent in the way it was negotiated. And it was decided that the best platform for that would be the CFS. And at that time, there was a discussion that maybe the document or maybe those ideas needed to be pulled apart into two different documents, one that would focus on guidelines for land tenure and one that would focus on guidelines for responsible investment, that they would be linked, but they would be two separate documents and two separate negotiations. So that's what led to, and then there was a decision that we would start with the, the land tenure guidelines. So we started with that in 2010. And in, 2012, after two long years of negotiations, people who were there can will remember this. Uh, we we were able to agree on um, the guidelines, the voluntary, the VGT. So you asked this question, you know, so what, you know, what was the feeling after the fact? So aside from exhaustion, I think that there was there was a lot of concern about how this was going to be implemented, right? And, and how that process was going to play out. And many of the questions that we're asking about it now were questions that we were kind of reflecting on, on this, in the sidelines then at that time. You know, how is it gonna be funded? What were the priorities gonna be? Who was gonna do the work? And who was gonna monitor the work? And none of those things which were included in the formal negotiations. I, I myself at the time was a bit concerned about how countries who were part of the negotiations we're going to communicate back to their capitals that they had agreed on this. And so what would that mean in terms of how they themselves would take this up? Um, that also was not part of the conversation at that time. So soft law notwithstanding, many of us were really concerned. So, you know, how is this going to actually play out? So now we have 10 years of this process. And I think now we have a great opportunity to reflect on what, what has worked and what, what hasn't worked. And so I'm looking forward to this discussion now as we move forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gregory, for um, that background and setting us up for the next question, which I will pose to Carol, uh, Mike, and Andreas. Uh, what does it look like uh, in each of your organizations uh, to put these guidelines into practice? Um, what have you observed over the last decade? of uh, you know, trying to implement uh, the VGGT. And why don't we start with Carol, then move to Mike and uh, then to Andreas. Thank you so much, Julia. And thanks to Adriano and Gregory for kicking us off. I would say um, on behalf of USAID that, that we see the VGGT as just an enormous legacy um, given Gregory's participation and leadership in the process. Um, and our uh, strong uptake of the VGGT, um, we're super excited to celebrate this anniversary and to report out on where we do see some progress. And I agree, I do definitely see progress. 
So for the sake of time, I'll be pretty quick and succinct. Um, I absolutely see that we are making progress in terms of gender issues and women's land rights. I think donors, um, both bilateral and multilateral donors, but as well, some governments have really stepped up to the plate and are, are working to try to implement changes to legal frameworks to provide more equitable access to land and resources. There is clearly a lot more work to do to close an implementation gap and to ensure that gender norms align with legal frameworks, but I do see progress on this front. Um, Adriano actually mentioned the issue of customary land areas, and I, I, I see this as, a, as an issue that we are making some progress on. USAID, for example, has been working in a number of different countries um, to recognize, secure the legitimate land rights of people living in customary land areas, whether that's in Tanzania, Zambia, Mozambique. Um, and I think the results so far are encouraging. One of the great differences between today and 10 years ago is that we do have more fit for purpose technologies and approaches, participatory approaches that we can use on the ground with communities to try to um, collect information and recognize those rights. And maybe finally on the progress side, I'll say that one of the most important changes over the last 10 years is that we do increasingly have some data about the level of tenure security people, men, women feel with regard to their land and their housing. And so um, that's just something we didn't have a decade ago. So continuing to develop a really robust set of data and continuing to expand the evidence base to me feels like an enormous step forward. But of course we have big challenges. Uh, I would say that um, ensuring the sustainability of land administration projects, particularly um, pro problems related to encouraging subsequent transactions, that's still a real sticking point for us and something that we all need to work on. The issue of indigenous people's land rights has really come up as an, an incredibly important issue and making sure that we can work with governments to address those political economy problems Adriano pointed to in order to recognize and really secure those rights will be critical, not only for climate change goals, but for biodiversity goals. Um, and then we need to make sure that we keep uh, developing our set of, com of uh, compatible and comparable data over time. Um, I think for those, uh, those on the line who are familiar with it, the Prindex project is a really nice example of developing a data set. Uh, but we need to continue to collect the data and make sure that we're able to look over time and see what progress is being made. So monitoring of the VGGTs can take place in a number of ways. And it's very exciting, I think, to see uh, not only the FAO, not only FAO doing monitoring, but other groups helping us understand what the status of tenure security is. Thank you, Yulia. I went on a bit, but um, floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's really great to be part of this discussion uh, and kudos to uh, New America and to USA. For organizing it. It's, it's really an honor to be reflecting on 10 years together with you of the VGGTs. The International Land Coalition was very much part of the negotiations that Gregory uh, described. Many of our members were engaged and saw it as a, as a really, really important um, effort to try and set these principles that everybody could agree on, on what good land governance is. A year after they were um, they were adopted at the Committee for World Food Security. The ILC, the members of ILC uh, put out the Antigua Declaration. They came together in Antigua and Guatemala and um, adopted a set of 10 commitments, which was the way that the ILC membership read the voluntary guidelines. So they took out from the voluntary guidelines the 10 key areas uh, that members um, coined, members coined the term people-centered land governance, that, that the VGGTs were a way of, of um, defining the kind of land governance we want to see and, and in fact even raised the bar higher uh, and said, okay, we, this is what we will work for in the frame of the voluntary guidelines. Uh, and so all ILC members who, who, um, since 2012 have um, adhered to what we call the 10 commitments to people-centered land governance. So that, it, and that really is is the adoption, the integration of what the, the VGGTs put out into the world 
into not just what ILC stands for, but what ILC works for. And so it's our program of action. Uh, it has been for the, for the last decade. So where have we got over the last decade? Maybe let me just share a couple of, uh, of reflections from just over a week ago, our membership came together uh, at the Dead Sea in, in Jordan. And the Dead Sea Declaration, one of the first statements it makes is celebrating the 10 years of the VGGTs and reaffirming that the VGGTs are as important and as relevant and as much um, in need today as, uh, as they ever were. One of the reflections I have from sitting in the sessions of the Global Land Forum was listening to um, a, a number of government, senior government officials. We were privileged to have um, a special session with about 15 uh, senior government officials from about 15 countries. And one after the other, they each stood up and they said, um, we can't push these land reform programs in our countries by ourselves. We need civil society. There are things that civil society can do that we can't do. Uh, and I, I, it really struck me as, as a, um, an expression of how the, the, the principles put out in the VGTs have become part of our normal discourse. That wasn't the case uh, for those of us that were, were working in these kind of circles before the VGTs. There was so much suspicion in many countries between civil society and their governments. And now it's just accepted and, it, and it's, it's the, 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 the partnerships, the, the model of good land governance, which is inclusive participatory that the VGD puts out is really part of, of what we see embraced in many, many countries, um, including by, by government officials. And I think that's really, really significant. My last um, thought comes from a, a report that we recently put out with the land matrix on trying to assess uh, quantitatively the extent to which the voluntary guidelines have shaped large scale land based investments. And unfortunately, the answer is not very well. 78% um, of all deals assessed um, by the land matrix uh, for this report showed inadequate uh, attention to uh, the key principles of the voluntary uh, guidelines. So while we have made enormous progress in terms of building a common vision of what good land governance should be in terms of building trust, building partnerships on the ground, still we don't see the kind of um, the reality of the VGTs uh, on the ground. And I think in conclusion, that really points to what um, all the speakers before me have have said, and that's that unless we get serious about shifting power, um, we know that the, the, the bad land governance we see is beneficial to some people. Uh, it's in the interests of people in, some people in power not to be uh, building good land governance models. Uh, and, so, and so our challenge really is if we want to close that gap between aspiration and reality, um, then shifting power is really going to be something we're going to have to do seriously. And that's why uh, talking more about indigenous peoples being in the leadership of securing uh, their land rights is, is very much what we need to be uh, not just talking about, but also uh, doing better. And, and certainly as ILC, that's part of our commitment. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, let me uh, thank you, Julia and Carol, for having GIZ on this panel. And uh, let me try to add a couple of points um, in addition to what was already mentioned. Uh, I think um, really the VGGTs have really put land on the agenda and we have seen such a spike in investment since 2010. Um, and uh, not only investments, but we have also seen a spike in learnings. Uh, there's a lot of studies that came out uh, we have we have seen a lot of evidence that was actually created, and I think um, uh, that is very crucial um, to understand or for us to understand how we can uh, move forward. Uh, for Germany, and I'm speaking from an implementer's perspective, for Germany, um, since 2010, there has been a tremendous increase in funding. Um, there is two flagship programs at the moment that GIZ is implementing on behalf of the federal government, um, and um, so this is really... Uh, extraordinary, I would say, since since then. And so the land question and the understanding sort of why land is important really has, I think, also uh, increased on the part of, of the donors and uh, of the international discussion. 
uh, we also have seen in Germany a very vibrant civil society engagement. The federal government itself engages with a lot of civil society groups in Germany. There's a standing working group on VGGT questions. So I think that's also quite crucial um, to have that conversation within the country. Um, let me add, uh, yeah, let me add one thing. Um, in Germany, we also have, and that's quite interesting, also not only the Ministry of Economic Cooperation um, and Development uh, working in that field, but also the Ministry of Agriculture that's also quite active. So that's also quite interesting. So you see how it, uh, how different parts of the of the government are actually working, working with the soft law that um, uh, we have already talked about. Um, let me mention two or three things um, that I find important from an implementer's perspective uh, and what we have learned and from the VGGT. So first of all, I'd say the VGGT are really a great guideline when you design programs. And um, I think it was also mentioned by Adriano earlier, uh, the concept of working with multi-stakeholder platforms, bringing actors together, engaging civil society, it's crucial. And um, these, these multi-stakeholder platforms, they have so many functions. They create evidence, uh, they create learnings, uh, they create understanding for each other. You can use them in policy dialogue. Um, I think it's quite a crucial um, element of, of technical cooperation, which uh, GIZ also uses a lot. Um, and one thing that was mentioned, but I want to mention it again, I think and that's really a milestone, I would say that the VGGT have really uh, uh, promoted. That is that, we have to combine the traditional and the modern uh, land law. And it sounds easy, but when you look at implementation, actually it's not so easy. And uh, you will find a lot of discussions also in the partner countries, how to go about it. And uh, I think one of the good examples uh, is probably Uganda. Uganda was also mentioned uh, by Adriano earlier. Uh, there are some countries that are really innovating. Uh, and um, I think that's important. And uh, I'm happy to share uh, some links with you later on uh, how GIZ was also able to help a little bit um, having that conversation and providing some solutions, how traditional um, securing traditional land rights and uh, securing modern land rights can, can coexist really well. Um, last remark, um, the, uh, I think the VGGTs also show us that we need to work really at the policy level with, with our partner countries, but we also need to sort of bring in the local experience or the implementation experience. And that multi-level approach, I think, is, is quite crucial and it's quite, um, is maybe not necessarily new for technical cooperation agencies, but I think uh, the VGGT really underlines it. It has to go together. So you have to work uh, at national level and um, also at regional or local level. And, um, yeah, these are just some of the some of the experiences I wanted to share, and I'm handing back to Julia. Thank you very much, Andreas, and thank you to the panelists uh, for a really rich set of experiences. You know, hearing about the critical importance of uh, civil society of working both at the policy level and locally, and perhaps some of the shortcomings um, from you know, uh, observed from the participation of the private sector, really going back to the principles behind the formation of the VGGTs as an inclusive multi-stakeholder process. So I wanna go back to um, a point that Adriano raised and that Gregory alluded to as well, which is around country adoption of the VGGT. Uh, and this is a question for everyone. Um, what have you observed as to why some countries are adopting the VGGT and some aren't? And uh, what are some of the successful ways that you found to encourage that adoption? Um, Yulia, maybe I'll kick us off and I'll be very brief. I think um, I appreciated Adriano's pointing to the political economy challenges of uh, adoption of the voluntary guidelines. So he rightly pointed out that there are, in countries where the VGGTs are not adopted um, and where land governance systems are not accountable, transparent, and responsive to the people, th there are folks in power who benefit from that situation. Um, and so we should all recognize that, right? And understand that um, the VGGT uh, may not be adopted if people perceive that the benefits are not of adopting them are not outweighed by the costs associated with adopting uh, the guidelines. The guidelines are voluntary. They do set 
a standard that we'd like to see countries address. But um, yeah, we need to recognize that that political economy uh, reality is, is one we have to deal with. Personally, I think that one really excellent way to deal with that challenge is by engaging in the kinds of network building and advocacy efforts that groups like the ILC engage in. So making sure that local people are clearly articulating what their desires and demands are from their government and backing up those efforts with support from other, other portions of society can be a really powerful combination. Advocacy efforts, I think, are critical to shifting um, the conditions on the ground and, and encouraging adoption. But I definitely do not want to say that I think this is easy in some countries. This is just going to continue to be very difficult. Over. Thank you, Yulia. Yulia, let me just jump in here for a second because I'd like to, I know we're going to run out of time and I'd like to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. I think it's really important for us to talk about the positive things that have happened, right? And the, the, the landmark nature of the voluntary guidelines. But I think we also need to ask the question, have we made, how much progress have we made? And could we have made more progress or what could we do differently to make more progress? I think uh, Jolene Sanjak and I recently published a paper on this, trying to triangulate and look at data to ask the question, just how many people's property rights have been recognized and or improved or, or registered um, as a result of this landmark agreement. And we couldn't find data that would, act, that would link an improvement of property rights to the voluntary guidelines. And, and so that led us to ask a lot of questions around you know, monitoring and evaluation and thinking about the way in which we could improve the implementation of this landmark agreement. And, and when we talk to experts in our field, you know, off the record, they will say things like, you know, it's dead. Nobody cares about it. It's, you know, it's yesterday's news. Um, and, and that's a little bit concerning because what I see happening is that we had a really big bang in 2012 and that maybe that big bang is starting to dwindle over time, right? And that we, because we were invested in, in the voluntary guidelines, we have one view of it and others have a different view, right? That maybe it's, it's not doing the work that we need to do. And when I look at the, at the country level, right? The number of people who still do not have property rights or don't have strong property rights, whether it's women or indigenous communities or just you know, rural folk, it's still a very small number, right? And they're still subject to having their land taken away from them, either by the private sector or by the state or other players. And so I, I think we need to really ask hard questions about, so how do we reverse that trend? What do we need to do differently um, that would perhaps improve the application of the voluntary guidelines? And this is the question that Julian and I asked in this paper. And one of those things that we raised was, you know, maybe we should think about doing business differently. Maybe in some ways we need to throw out the baby and the bathwater. Um, maybe the way we're doing business now, you know, bilaterals and multilaterals, et cetera, doing our own thing, maybe this is not giving us enough momentum and energy to really grapple with the issue. And maybe we need to look at other sectors around the world who are also grappling with complex issues and how they've developed different mechanisms, different approaches for, for dealing with those complex issues. So something that's very, very different, a very different approach. The way in which money is raised, the way in which money is managed, the way in which money is utilized, the way in which priorities are selected, the way in which we engage with countries. So I think that that's the future of the discussion around the voluntary guidelines, thinking very differently about the way we're doing the work and the way we're doing the work collectively, right? So I would really like to hear the other panelists' thoughts about the future and how we maybe re-energize this work and maybe try to, to build on what we've accomplished so far in a much more significant way. Thank you. Thanks, Gregory. And I see Andreas has his hand up. Over to you, Andreas. Thanks. I didn't want to be the first one, but OK. Yeah, it's an important question. I think it points down to uh, really what kind of sustainable financing models we can also think about. And um, let me just say that uh, I think there's also some countries, when we say adopting VGGT, we actually see a, 
a few countries that have their own land laws that were made independently, I would say from the VGGTs like Benin, for example, where I have some experience. So there are actually some countries that have laws in place that are not necessarily connected to the VGGTs, but that may, may be, or may have to be part of, of, a, of a more comprehensive study as Gregory was suggesting. I think one of the crucial issues is really how can countries, first of all, what evidence can we create that registering land and the countryside is beneficial and, and then how do you afford it? And what could be the what could be a financing model behind this? And I, I know not a lot of good examples, but I think what I know from Uganda is Uganda has tried to really build this national registry around urban areas, around the greater Kampala area, and then has started uh, with the help of the World Bank uh, to spread it uh, into the regions. Uh, and that's building sort of a modern registry. So using sort of starting in a in a in, in, in an urban area and spreading it to 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 regions and then spreading out to uh, rural areas, I think is is quite uh, an interesting thought. Uh, I'm not sure if there are other other uh, similar or different examples of countries that have um, uh, developed such models. But I think, yeah, this is this is absolutely central and I would be happy to uh, to learn more about this maybe from the other panelists. Back to you. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, anyone else want to jump in either on the question of, you know, uh, country implementation or adoption of the BGGT or on um, Gregory's point of where do we go from here? Julia, I think transitioning to where do we go from here is, an, is a great idea and also appreciate Gregory's challenges. Um, on Andreas's point, yeah, I think this is part of, it's got to be part of the future. How do we identify innovative approaches that are going to meet demand? First of all, how do we understand demand from people? Uh, demand in urban areas is very different from demand in some rural areas. And so we can't provide the same solution to those different uh, those different constituents. So understanding demand and then providing the appropriate, innovative, fit for purpose approaches to securing tenure is going to work in some places. It's going to be more difficult in other places for a variety of concerns. I mean, for me, I think looking forward, one of the critical issues, I'm going to hark back to something I said a moment ago, is that we really need to be focused on ensuring that we are working with local organizations, local advocacy networks, and government, as Mike said, at multiple levels, local, regional, national levels, to try to come to consensus about what can be done and to provide the evidence base around what works. One of the great developments of the last 10 years is that we do have a growing evidence base, a base of rigorous evidence that's um, been conducted through impact evaluations and through other rigorous means to show us what's the connection between land tenure interventions and increased investment, land tenure interventions and women's economic empowerment, land tenure interventions and um, natural improved natural resource management. So uh, that's an important piece of the puzzle. Will we still have societies or countries where um, your people in leadership positions are not going to want to improve the land governance situation? Yeah, probably so. So that's the really challenging question. What do you do in the countries? What can you do in the countries where leadership is benefiting from dysfunctional systems? And how can you encourage change in those situations? I think Gregory's right. We need to think hard and differently about those challenges. Mm. Thank you, Julia. If I could just jump in, Julia, Julia, on that point, because I think that's absolutely critical. And just to reinforce that the the, the amount of innovation we've seen has been has been tremendous. Uh, if if you have a look on the ILC website at the database of good practice, we've compiled since the VGGs came in a, a, a database with um, over a hundred and a hundred practices focused on building people-centered land governance that are not theoretical, but based on what the members of, of ILC are doing. And they're, and, and they're great. And, you know, in many ways, Africa is, is at the head of, of, of the innovation. You know, what we see in so many land policy reforms in, in Africa is, is, is tremendous. But that's the, the, what we're suffering from now is not the lack of, of, of good examples. It's the, it's the political will to, to get these these aspirations or these policies or these guidelines uh, uh, onto the ground and that's why i think it, it keeps coming back to 
to really what is the center of the VGGTs. And it's interesting listening to each of the panelists talk. As, as each, of, each of us have talked about the VGGTs, the VGGTs is sometimes easy to forget. It's, it's a big document. It, it encapsulates so many different aspects of, of land governance. But what we almost always talk about is multi-stakeholder platforms, that good land governance is a multi-stakeholder process. And that really in, 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 is at the heart of the VGGTs. And if we keep coming back to that heart, and we focus our efforts on building supporting processes in countries uh, that really the land users themselves, women's organizations, indigenous people's organizations, farmers' organizations, young people's organizations uh, are, are at the helm of, then I think looking to the future, I have, I have a lot of hope because these are the engines within the countries that will hold their old governments accountable, um, that, will, that will keep pushing processes. And in those countries where we see progress on the VGCs, I think that's a critical success factor. I would also just lastly like to give a shout out to the donors that continue to fund land governance reform, because as we, as we observe, there are not many countries that put their own budgets, significant budgets of their own into it. And, and on this panel, we have two, we have BMZ and we have USAID that are real, real champions of, of funding land governance reform. And we need, we need more of them because, because without the funding, it's not gonna happen. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you, Gregory, for uh, turning us, as you always do, towards the future and where do we go from here. So we just have a few minutes uh, left for audience Q&A, so I'll turn to asking a couple of questions. Um, the first one is to Adriano. Uh, the question is, uh, at the end of your remarks, you mentioned uh, a point about you know, what we can do to do more to apply the VGGT beyond tenure. Uh, what did you mean by that? Thanks, Julia, for, for I think my, my video is not is not allowed as yet. Uh, yeah, you cannot start because the host has stopped it. Uh, so um, I don't know if you can allow the video, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, let me go straight to the, to the response. Uh, basically, what, what I mean by that is that we should not take a silo uh, uh, approach to land tenure. So besides what happens on, on, on the remit of uh, uh, land policy negotiations, there's a number of other policy making that involves land tenure uh, that can be absolutely uh, uh, opportunistic and can bring a lot uh, of, of, of new elements. Two examples. Uh, we have had the, the, the UN Convention on Desertification, Combat of Desertification, that uh, a couple of years ago have uh, identified land tenure as a fundamental element uh, for land degradation neutrality. Uh, that generated uh, recently on this COP that happened a month ago, uh, a, new, a new manual and, and, and a new mandate uh, as well uh, on land tenure uh, and, and, and combat to desertification. So that's, that's a new avenue of advancing land tenure uh, beyond, but in connection with land policy reports. Another example uh, on the COP26 uh, of, on climate, uh, when we had the announcement of the pledge of 1.7 billion uh, for indigenous peoples and local communities, which I'm very glad to see an, a number of the signatories of the pledge here, US, Germany, uh, for instance, uh, was a historical moment because when, when that pledge was made, it was very clear that it should focus on uh, indigenous peoples and local communities' tenure rights as a fundamental element of stopping uh, deforestation. That's again, a great avenue to advance tenure rights uh, through those negotiations. That's what I mean going beyond. But having said that, I, I cannot escape the temptation to go back to, to Gregory's uh, question looking at the future. I think there is a crucial element uh, of really be innovative without losing the core. And I think the core, the fundamental change that the VGT process has brought uh, is the ability to empower and enable uh, local land, land right holders groups and civil society to have a long-term process of holding the barriers to account uh, through, the, through the MSPs and through all the process of dialogue. So we cannot lose that into lose, lose perspective from that. As much as we innovate, uh, we need to innovate without losing the ability of strengthening the agency of land tenure rights holders uh, on holding duty barriers to account, because that's what, by the end of the day, gives a sustainable a sustainability perspective on policy change, that you have a group of people that will constantly be able 
to claim for their rights, to hold people to account, uh, and to increase their own agency uh, on promoting change on the ground. Because without that, we know that land is very political and it tends to uh, uh, be dominated by the more powerful groups in society. Thank you. Thank you, Adriano. And we'll have time for just one more question uh, that uh, I think we can pose uh, first to Andreas, but uh, if Andreas, if, if you'd like to answer quickly and if anyone else would like to uh, jump in, um, that would be fantastic. So the question that came in from the audience is specific to Mali and I'll read it. Um, I want to understand how the new land law of Mali in 2020 incorporates the principles of the BGGT given the fact that this land incorporates compulsory customary land tenure in the government domain. But let me expand that because you had also touched on Uganda um, and frame the question a little bit more broadly. How do you see uh, the interface between the VGGT um, incorporating customary tenure? Thank you, Julia. Uh, I cannot say much about Mali, honestly. Um, for Uganda, I think uh, it's crucial here that Uganda has recognized that in different regions of the country, you have different uh, types of land uh, of land um, sort of customs and um, also requirements of what what people are are willing to do and interested to do. Whether it's going more into a, a customary uh, way of registering land, or you have areas where you have leases, so. I think, and, and that's where the VGGTs, I think, come in, uh, the sort of the recognition of the diversity of a country, where a country stands at a certain point in time, and how <clears throat> then sort of law should react to, uh, to that situation to move forward on the land question. I think that's crucial, and that's what the VGGTs are promoting. So I think um, that's why they really play a very strong role. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't uh, say much about Mali. Back to you. Julia, I'll, I'll, I know we're basically out of time, but um, I'll say very quickly, I think a lot of great work has been done uh, in terms of working with customary communities, leaders, particularly um, in a country like Zambia, USAID has been working very closely with the House of Chiefs to promote um, innovative approaches to registering customary lands and actually working with the chiefs to promote women's land rights in those areas. So more examples like that, that can adopt the inclusive participatory approaches that we've all been talking about around um, implementing the VGGTs, I think are important. And um, I wanted to thank all my fellow panelists today and Adriano for being with us. I'll turn the floor back to you, Yulia, as we come to the end of our time. Thank you very much, Carol. I would like to sincerely thank all of our panelists for a really fantastic discussion. Uh, you know, it's uh, amazing to reflect on a decade of implementing this really landmark agreement. And I'll uh, leave you with a uh, you know question that I didn't get a chance to ask because we ran out of time, but maybe something for us to ponder, which is, you know, is it time for a VGGT 2.0 or a new agreement or um, uh, you know a modified agreement uh, and what can we do to increase uh, the participation in implementing this really landmark uh, soft law moving forward uh, something for us all to ponder uh, but in the meantime I wish everyone a uh, wonderful day thank you again for joining us and uh, goodbye <laughs>